Right, let me just talk you through it. It was made in, uh, well, 13th of May 1967. Hello, welcome to this video. You can see uh, Big Dave, um, very shortly me, uh, loading a 27 kilowatt uh, solid wood fueled stove which has a boiler uh, attachment. And this is the start of my installation of a wood fired boiler system in my own house. You will see me use electronics, plumbing, building, all sorts of skills enabling this, uh, hopefully, to power all the radiators in my house. If you haven't seen the previous videos on fitting the radiators, doing the test with the diesel heater and why I decided not to go for a heat pump, have a look back at my videos. But for the meantime, enjoy this and I'll uh, see you shortly. All right, so <clears throat> just finished doing some filming on the generator and that sort of stuff. Got a, a little problem. Is my stove for the off-grid um, heating video, and it weighs get this 212 kilos. I can't lift it. Me and Big Dave struggled to lift it. Anyway, I've got to get this out today. Let me introduce you to the beast. It was made in, uh, well, 13th of May 1967. There you go, Roughneck, Portsmouth, uh, runs on a Honda engine, driving, just driving a hydraulic pump. The seals and everything are perfect on this, no leaks, and look, that will stay up for a long time. It's very hard to manoeuvre. It's not power steering. Just a chain drive to the wheel, uh, which does another <laughs> wheel on fight that bar. It works, but not the best. But the attachments you can have on it the big bucket, the front loader, the fork lift that's the most useful thing. And it will lift like half a ton, 600. I've actually had it lifting 700 kilos a steel beam. Uh, it also is towable and I've got the wheels and the attachment so the wheels go in the bottom pieces there and the same on the other side and it's got a tow ball hitch and it fits on your car and you just drive it kitchen, 16, 16 parts per million carbon monoxide and that is just from doing that bit 
we just saw the door open. Good afternoon. This section, I just want to cover a couple of quick uh, electronic things for the installation here of my new heating system. The heating system itself uh, is going to be wood fired, but in order for this to work properly, I need to monitor the temperatures in the cylinders, the hot water cylinder and the thermal store the stove itself, flows, radiator temperatures, that kind of thing. The way I'm going to achieve that is use something called Home Assistant, which is a program that I've loaded onto a mini computer, which is uh, then contacted through the Wi-Fi and uses these little devices. So inside this is a wireless uh, chip, there's a USB socket for power and you can use this to integrate with any sensor or electronic component that you've got and then display that information on your computer. What are you doing? Let me sort that out. Okay, so we've made that little device. I'll show you a bit more in a second. This is my electric water heater, very old. I do have a new one. Um, it's, uh, oh, it's over there somewhere. You can just see it poking up. Anyway, we're gonna use this as a test. So we've got four sensors. So we need to install them, um, probably well, split it into quarters really, um, and then stick the sensors in there. And it'll give me an idea of how the water is sitting in the tank. Um, so I'm expecting the bottom to be cooler, and the top to be warmer, and then a nice little um, layering in between. So in order to do that, we need to get the sensor in contact with the tank. Now, if you want to see what's inside these tanks, have a look at my other video. But we need to drill through the outer skin, through the insulation, and just touch the tank. scary but we're in uh, and luckily luckily I've labeled all the probes up uh, on the computer so I know which one goes where it's just a question of inserting the probes and then probably screw the device to the outside jacket and uh, let's see what results we get gas glue gun let me tell you a story about this. In 1999, I bought this. And before eBay, before the internet, before anything, you had QVC, shopping channel. And sometimes at night, if maybe I'd had a glass of uh, wine or a few beers, uh, you would end up with things arriving on your doorstep. That you never even knew about. No emails, no not, nothing back then. And this turned up one day. Uh, I can't remember ordering it, but I'm glad I did. It's amazing and it's been working since 1999. Superb. Alright, so we've got 43.8. 41, 36, 28. So that's what we'd expect to see. Um, hotter at the top, cooler at the bottom, and then in between. 
So another advantage of this is it logs the data. So what I'm going to do is keep that running overnight because then the, the cylinder charges up at about two o'clock in the morning for a couple of hours. So we should be able to see that on the graph. So, okay, so that's it. I'll see you in the morning and let's see what happens to the temperatures at each level. Good morning. So, where are we at with this? Test set setup. If you remember, we've got the four probes in. Measuring the temperature, I've labeled this up <coughs> using a Back to the Future style numbers and then numbers on the sides corresponding. This is embarrassing, but it's all I've got um, spare at the moment, USB wise to power it. I have got stuff on order to sort that out. I've also, let's just have a look over here, been busy with the electric meter. So I've connected in an opto coupler, goes to a wireless chip similar that we put in the other one. This is just for testing purposes. <coughs> and what that does is it uh, reads all the details from the meter and sends it to my iPad phone or whatever. And we can use that to look at the power consumption on each particular phase any one time. It's quite interesting. Uh, so I'll just show you how that manifests on, a, on here. So this is an overview. So currently the top of the tank is 40... 43 degrees and the house is using uh, about 660 watts so if you want more information you can go to the heating side of things there you go current temperatures at the tank now this graph is the last five days so you can see the temperatures at different levels so very quickly uh, the bottom goes down to about 20 degrees but the top does maintain the temperature now I've had four or five people stay in at one time here so that's why the maximum temperature never reaches the top but now it's back to 45 which is what it's set at because I'm here on my own now that's interesting you can use that also let's have a look at the electricity so here we go, linky meter readings. All the, this information is available. So it's updated every 10 seconds. So you can see phase two is the one that's taking the most power. But interestingly, if I tap on this, there you go. I can see, <coughs> see what's been happening. So, uh, around about midnight, the heater, the water heater comes on. Then it reaches temperature and it goes off, on, off, on, off, on. And at the bottom, you can just see this little ripple down the bottom is probably the fridge overnight. So the fridge comes on and then off, on, on, off, on, on, off, on, on, off. And then I got up this morning about half past seven and made a coffee, which is this one here. And then uh, later on, this smaller one, smaller peak there. That's when the heated floor in the, my ensuite came on. You still got the fridge coming on as well. Then another coffee. And then you can see how many coffees I've had, look. Three coffees. All right, they were easily, reasonably easy to do, um, but it's important because um, with the solid fuel system we're gonna fit, I need to know exactly what's going on at every part in the system. And the electric one, that was more of just a test, but we'll need to know that because of the solar system that's gonna come on. Uh, and this is capable of measuring all sorts, like how much is going out to the grid, how much is coming in and that sort of stuff. So that will be used later on. Okay, so here's my interface for the Linky. At the moment I've just got it plugged in here. With a little on-off switch. All the electronics are in there. 
and the connection to the meter is that I've gone all back to the future with the, with the retro labeling. I just like the look of it. That's it really. Uh, you've seen the hot water heater. Oh, now we're on to the hot water tanks and stuff. Uh, right, so downstairs, uh, the new hot water thermal store will go in that corner. And if you can see that thing there, white thing poking out, is actually a brand new twin coil 200 litre hot water tank. But in order to do that, I'm going to take this rack and put it over here. And then I'm going to uh, open that space out because the new thermal store <coughs> is actually taller than the space we've got from the floor to the ceiling. So I'm going to really look forward to that. That took a long time, a few hours. Uh, but for you, it was seconds. Can you believe it? Anyway, we can see the space here that we've got. So in this space, we're going to have to fit this tank, which is the hot water tank. But we're also going to have to fit the thermal store. The thermal store is two meters tall by about a meter wide. And then you're probably already thinking it's a bit. Uh, short on height. So let's have a measure and see what we've got. Currently we've got 1 meter 90 which is not enough obviously. So the options are two small tanks but that's not as good for stratification. By that I mean the bottom of the tank is cold and the top is hot and then there's a, there's a gradient in between and that's essential really for the type of system we're doing. If you split it into two tanks, yes you can do it, but it's not as good. So a taller tank is better. So if we can't go up, the only option is down. Morning, Sunday morning. Today's the day, dig the hole. Yeah, lovely. So I'll mark it out, show you where we're going to dig and then uh, let's do it. Here we go. So I've marked out the edge where I'm going to dig but it's actually going to be a bit smaller. I just need enough space. And I can treat you, I don't know if you can see, there's a circle that shows you where the cylinder is going to be. We have enough space down this side for access around the back and also for um, access to the pipes that come down from the ceiling and uh, the wires. And I can run the pipes that I need down there as well. Yeah, so that's my square. So I better get digging. 350 mil down. We'll start there and go from there. Okay, <clears throat> did a, dug a little bit of a hole there. And that is the finished height of the top of the concrete. So then we've got to have 150 mil further than that, and that'll be our depth. You don't want to watch me dig that, so stand by. Five, four, three, two, one. There you go. Easy as that. Except it took me a week. <laughs> but there you go. So that's the required depth. So now we need a reinforced concrete base and you can see the foundations stop. So you've got about 25 centimetres. Uh, but this is really, really hard ground. And it's all rock and shale. 
And if anyone's wondering about water ingress or anything like that, it's been raining constantly for two days and this hole's been there and uh, no problem. But I'm going to do some concrete panels at the back. Um, so it'll be more of a, an enclosure, not an enclosure, but anyway, a base for sides. So, what's next? Well, I've just been and got two tons of sand to make the concrete with. I've already got some gravel and I've got some cement. So, I'm going to go unload the sand from the trailer or put the trailer away or something like that. Okay, here we are. Raining today. Look at the roof. I think it's seen bad times. Anyway, this whole building, I've got um, an architect working on some planning for it. So the roof will be coming off anyway, so I'm not too worried. And uh, got my 4,000 litres for rainwater storage ready to go. That's part of the off grid series as well as, uh, as this. Today, the problem is the trailer has 2,000 kilos of sand in it. It's a lot of sand and it's really wet and slippery, but I can't disconnect the car until I've emptied the trailer and I need the car. And the van doesn't work, which you'll see on other videos. So, I think what I'm going to do is reverse the oh, raining again now. Reverse the trailer in and dump all the sand here and then use the digger probably to put the sand over here. So I've got hardcore gravel and then that's an old bag of rubbish sand. I put all the decent sand there. Get rid of that. Yeah, it was so heavy that when I was reversing, when it got to the edge here, um, the brake went on on the trailer and stopped. <laughs> Very useful to have, not cheap, but saves you so much money and time. It's unbelievable. For example, this uh, this load here is 2,000 kilos. All right, it's wet, so it's probably 200 kilos of that is water, maybe, maybe a bit less. But the whole thing was 92 pound for all that sand. Pound euros, anyway. All I've got to do is just go and collect it. All right, that's it for this video. Uh, it's all preparation so far. Uh, nothing amazing going in, but you'll see it's all worthwhile in the end, hopefully. So thanks for watching. Um, you can always buy me a coffee if you find it interesting. Uh, if not, um, just like it, subscribe. I'll see you on the next one.